Tongham is a small village in Surrey. It's sandwiched in between the Victorian town of Aldershot and the ancient chalk spine of the Hog's Back. Tongham is an old place. In the Middle Ages, it was called Twangham. I lived in Twangham, I mean Tongham, for about 20 years, and I liked it just fine. It has a charming church, and it even has treacle mines. And I expect one day somebody might make a film about that. But this film is all about the football match that garnered this sleepy little village an infamous entry in the Guinness Book of Records. In November of 1969, Tongham Youth Football Club played Hawley Reserves in a local cup match. Before the day was done, the referee had booked all 22 players, including a man who had to go to hospital. The referee also booked one of the linesmen. Tongham won the game 2-0. And the match was described by a player as being a good, hard game. So there are the facts, 23 bookings in one game. Something that had never happened before and has never happened since. So what is the story? What happened on that day that led to 23 young men all being booked? What do you think might have happened? Let me tell you why I'm making this film. Some years back I found myself on the other side of the world, about 13,000 miles that way. I was on a dive trip in Indonesia, going to dive on a sunken volcano. My dive buddy was this slightly potty European chap called Bernard. Bernard said, So John, where are you from in England? And I said, Tongham, expecting him to say, I've never heard of the place, but instead, his face lit up. He was delighted. Tongham, he said. Oh, Tongham, yeah, 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 the football, the Guinness Book of Records, you're from there. After we finished the dive, Bernard came up to me with a lukewarm beer and he said, so, I want to hear everything. Tell me all about it. Tell me the story. And I stood there with my mouth open and no sound came out. I didn't know any more than Bernard. You see, I moved to Tongham in the late 70s and everything I'd heard about the match was a faint echo of something from the Guinness Book. It was almost as though the quote had taken on its own life. It had consumed the real event. And I think that's when it started. Some small, curious worm had burrowed into my subconscious and laid its egg. And now that egg's hatched and it's time for me to stop wondering and guessing, I'm going to find out what happened. I want to find team sheets. I want to find reports. I want to find photos. I want to meet, if I can, the players and the officials involved in that match and get them to share their memories with me. I want to get to the truth behind what's become a myth. That's why I'm making this film. And Bernard, if you're watching, settle down and pour yourself a beer. I started my research on the net, but I couldn't find anything useful or new. There was this sadly neglected team page and it made me wonder, was the team even still going? I drove down to Tongham Recreation Ground. It was a dismal, damp, dull day. It seemed I was in the right place, but nobody was home. I bumped into a woman who was walking a small yappy poodle. We got chatting and I told her what I was doing. I don't want to be in your video, she said, but I can help you. She gave me the phone number of the chairman of the club, a man called Les. And before I had a chance to say thank you properly, she was gone. And as the sun broke through the clouds, I headed for home, clutching Les's phone number. I slipped into something comfy. I gave Les a ring. I told him what I was looking for, and what he said to me was like music to my ears. Sure, okay. Now is there anybody is there anybody in the village that you know definitely was in that team who's not, in the village not now? Without, not without asking. I, I don't know, but what I can do is I can get some information and get it to you quite quickly and okay. what happened is you'll probably find that these leads will lead to others. Well that's promising. We might be on the right road. Next day I printed out some posters asking for information saying, Can you help? I took them down to the village. I got them stuck up in a few shop windows and started asking the locals if they knew anything about the match. 
Hello. Hello. All 22 players got booked. It was before I moved here. It's in the Guinness World Record books. Oh, I don't know. We saw it in the Guinness World Record books and then we were just talking about it at, at the club. It's just different people's, well, and there seems to be their opinion of what happened that day. All 22 people got booked. Oh, brilliant. In this match. Oh, great. Do you know anything about it? It's no idea, mate. I'm okay. new to the area. Um, no idea. All right, well, best of luck with you uh, with trying to find out. Post office lady said, no, you can't film security. The one where all 22 players were booked. Big party. <laughs> just been in here, just been talking to the lady, Vicar. This is Vicar. She doesn't know any more about the whole thing than I do. She's only been here a year. I didn't take the camera in because I didn't have uh, clearance from... Uh, Guess who I haven't heard from? Les. And I haven't had any phone calls yet from my posters. So I'm going to ring the local paper and see if they've got any archive material about the match. I contacted local papers. I got in touch with the FA at local and county level. I talked to archivists, museums, busybodies and loonies. And I got the same response from everyone. Nobody had any information at all about the football match. It was almost as though the match had never happened. So I phoned Guinness. Can I please speak to uh, Mr Guinness? Even they had nothing beyond the words on the page in their book. Nothing about sources, how the entry was validated, no extra information. I found that rather odd. Fancy the Guinness Book of Records not having any records. I found a website for the Hawley Football Club but these guys started in 2004. The team Tom played back in 1969 were long gone. Most of the people I got in touch with were really helpful. They offered to pass my details on to other people who might be able to help me. They made suggestions. They gave me other leads. But after a few days of this, it didn't really feel like I was getting anywhere. There was one tiny glimmer of hope that one of the local libraries might hold microfiches for the local papers for November 1969. One small possibility. I still haven't heard from Les. I still haven't had any phone calls or emails from my posters. So today I'm going to go to Aldershot Library, hopefully to have a look at their archive of microfiches and see if there's anything about this blinking football match. <laughs> I'm in the library. I've had an epiphany. I came in and this really nice lady helped me to, to load up the microfiche thing. As she rolled the page up for November, first article, on the right hand side, a report about the match. So I've got my starting point. I've got my starting point. I haven't even read it yet. I've just got to carve it out a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm in... This is a breakthrough. I thought it was going to be here for hours and days, trawling through all these stories. But no, first story, right hand side. Marvellous. Microfiche copy printed out. All done here. After I left the library, I thought I'd pop round to see my uncle. And I hadn't read the article because I, I wanted to sort of savour it. So I got to my uncle's, read the article out to him. We laughed a lot and unbelievably, in the article is the name and the address of the referee. So I'm going to look him up on the internet and I'm going to see if he still lives there. Uh, do that. Oh, I spelt it wrong. Oh, that's come up. Yep. That's the referee's address and we are we're only here. We're half a. We're half a. Mile. We're half a mile from where he lived. So, <laughs> as my uncle, he's just come say, say hello, Uncle Alec. Hi there. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go. I'll go around and see him. Oh, hundreds of pages. Well, I'm not going to read the entire internet now. I've got an address. So let's get round there, shall we? This is the address. So I guess the thing now is just to knock on the door and see what happens. I don't know what I'm going to do if he's there. Thank you. 
There was no reply. I knocked on a few neighbours' doors. Even the ones who'd lived there a long time didn't know anything about a John McAdam. He must have moved years ago. Which is a bit disappointing after the excitement of finding that article today. It's kind of it's a bit deflating, but I guess that's how it goes. Uh, so, mm, get home and have a cup of coffee. I heard that this place might have microfiches for other local papers from 1969. I did my microfiche operating magic and I found this article in the Farnham Herald. Basically a rehash of the Aldershot News article. I also found a confirmation of the match listing. And I also found this odd article about unpleasant goings on at Tongham's home ground the very same week they played their fateful match against Hawley. My uncle found a John McAdam in one of his old phone books. We tried the number with no luck, but I got the address and I went round. Just been to the address my uncle found in the phone book and the man said uh, John McAdams moved away about five or six years ago. He thinks he went down to Wales. Not doing too well with actually tracking people down at the moment. I've been on this about, I don't know, 12 days and so far I haven't talked to a player or an official or anybody who was at the match. Oh, and I haven't heard from Les. Somewhere in Wales. How many people are in Wales these days? I wonder if I could just drive down shouting, John McAdams, what do you think? Do you think that would work? No. Stupid. Why am I making so much effort to find the referee? Well, even if I only meet up with a couple of players, their version of events is going to be quite different to that of the referees. So I need his input to get balance for this film. I'm aware of this. And now you're aware that I'm aware. Let's move on. But you might want to keep that in mind. I spoke to a lady called Caroline who told me that she knew there was a photograph of the Tongham youth huh. team. We're at the Tongham Recreation Ground. I've come down to meet Caroline, or possibly Tracy, and they're going to show me a rather superb photograph. And there was a picture as well. That's that what had, I've yeah. come to see, yeah. Right, yeah. so I'll get that oh, out for you. Thank you. Ah, OK. The cartoon was excellent, lots of fun, but not actually very informative or useful for me. I wanted to see the photo of the team. Well, Tracy just dug out the cartoon for me. Oh, right, yeah. So, yeah, have yeah, a look yeah. at that. Did look. you find the photo no, over there? No, I didn't. There's, there's rather a lot of them here. Yeah. Which one is it? That's the one. This one? Yes. I believe that's the, that's the bunch, yeah. OK. At last, I was face to face, well, face to photo, with the team. I looked into the faces and I wondered, are these the men I'm looking for? Will I be able to find them? Will they want to speak to me? And as I wondered all these questions and more, Caroline came back over and said, have you got in touch with June yet? Who's June, I said. June Beardle, she was married to Charlie Beardle. He was the chairman of the club for 36 years and he was the manager when the match took place. And then she gave me June's phone number. And I was on my way. Oh, hello, June. It's John Bush. Um, I'm I'm in Manor Road, but it's so dark I can't see the numbers. Can you can you guide me in, please? Whereabouts am I? June was incredibly helpful. Unfortunately, Charlie passed away in 2009, but June showed me scrapbooks like this one when Tongan won three cups in one year. I was amazed when June identified nearly everybody in the photograph that had been taken over 45 years before. And although she didn't have phone numbers and addresses for the folks, she told me stuff about them that would help me track them down. 
I think he's away. So who's the chap with the beard then? Is that that's a... Charlie? Oh, that's Charlie. That is that's Charlie. Char that is Charlie. Young yeah. Charlie. That is young oh, Charlie. Right. Yeah, that's when he took. The, he used to take the youth team. <laughs> oh God! Oh dear, okay. dear. I talked to Pete Bryant at the local paper with a view to getting him to do an article to publicise my efforts. I thought, well, with the local press on board, that's bound to wake things up. Seeing Pete Bryant from New Shot News, Monday, 11 o'clock, at the place where they are, to see how he may help. Right, good. <laughs> Once Pete got the information he needed and we'd had a cuppa, I asked him how far could I rely on the accuracy of the article I'd found on the microfiche. After all, it was all I had. Well, I mean, these days, um, obviously we have the internet, we have telephones. Back in 1969, it would have been perhaps a little bit different. Um, even today, it's all about contacts. And I think very much then it would have been all about contacts. They'd have um, got in touch with their contact for Tom and Youth and got their version of what happened. Looking at this, it does seem like they've, they've talked to the ref and I think you can rely on the fact that this is what the reporter has done also. I think it's as accurate as you can get really in terms of a first-hand resource. I still haven't heard back from Les. I live quite close to Tongham in a town called Farnham, but we don't get the Aldershot news, so I drove down to my auntie's to have a look at her copy. And I forgot my glasses. Documentary being created by a filmmaker from Farnham. Pete Bryant had done an outstanding job with the article. There's the story, the photo, and me asking for help. It's all there. I got home, I checked my voicemail, and it had begun. I got my first contact from an actual player. My name is Dennis Roll. It's uh, about the Tom Football Day. I actually played in that game. Over the next few months, Dennis Roll would be contacted. Over the next few days, I got a steady trickle of emails and phone calls. I suddenly had a lot of leads, and the next few months looked like this. Yesterday was a very busy day, lots of interneting, lots of ancestry sites and find this, find that sites, lots of checking out social media, lots of phone calls, lots of knocking on doors. Not many results, but at least I've been able to um, cross some names off the list. Right, that one's done, that one's done. That one can't be done, that one's done, that one's done. Good afternoon, Mr. Hell. Robert Davis. <gasps> And Peckham. The only one was in Middlesex. The only one he lives in uh, Farnborough. That's I, him, that's him. Oh my, that's got to be him, isn't it? I think so. Oh. Some people were easier to find than others. June had said, Terry Lambert, he's an artist. So I put Terry Lambert artist into Google and look what I found. Uh, good morning. Is Terence Lambert there, please? Hello. Oh, hi. Is Dennis there, please? Hello. Hello there. Is that Michael James? It is indeed. Hello there. I think it was a 50-50 ball and he kicked a chap in the face. So he got a, le a letter from Ted Croker and he said, Dennis Lambert, Ted Croker, I discovered that this Tongham youth team photo I've been working from is from 1969, but isn't of the actual team who played against Hawley. It turns out that seven of these fine fellows played on the actual day, and by picking their brains and following other leads, I've been able to identify the missing men. Dennis is the first actual player I'm going to interview. Just been to see Ray Fitchett. I'm off to see uh, Dennis and Caroline. I'm off to see a lady called Sue Green. I'm about to um, go and interview Mickey James. Ken and Terry Lambert told me stories I can't possibly put on the camera. Who was the naughty boy who got sent off? And he sang me the team song. I just picked up a copy of today's Aldershot News because I spoke to Pete Bryant in the week and he said he'd put me in another article, which he has. What a good man. Well done, that man, Pete. Record-breaking fixture is retold for the small screen. Of course, everybody's got big screens these days, though, haven't they? Crucially, it's asking for Hawley players to get in touch with me because I still haven't heard from the Hawley team. 
and I still haven't heard from Les. I checked. It's true. I'm at the dump. I'm going to my Uncle Alex, my internet super sleuth uncle. He sent me a very teasing email last night and I thought rather than just emailing him back or phone, I'd go over. Hello. Good day. I had to come and see you after that email. My uncle's been doing loads of research for me over the weeks, trawling through websites and following leads, but this latest email from him felt different. Well, we know John McCallum, he married yeah. in 1967, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. And they had a couple of children. Yeah. He's in Wales. You could write him a nice letter. Yes, I agreed with my uncle. I could write him a nice letter. Or, as I've got his address, I could drive down to Wales and knock on his door. You're probably ahead of me. I drove along narrow lanes. I drove through tears of rain. I found John McAdam. And he was friendly. And he bought me a drink in the local pub. And he told me he wanted nothing at all to do with my film. As far as he was concerned, the past was past and that was where it belonged. And though I begged and pleaded, and snivelled and cajoled and attempted to coerce and bribe him, he wasn't having any of it. I explained that all I wanted to do was give him an opportunity to put forward his version of events, his version of the truth, but he wasn't interested and he wished me luck and sent me on my way. I left my details with him, but I didn't hear anything. And that was that. After four months of digging around, I've interviewed most of the Tongham team, but I've had absolutely no joy finding anybody from the Hawley team. And you know all about the ref, so I didn't get to see everybody I hoped I might. But that's okay. That's just how it goes. And now it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce you to people who are intimately connected with the match. People who are going to tell you in their own words about the match. They're going to tell you about Tongham Youth Football Team. We're going to hear about the man behind the team, the legendary inspirational Charlie Beardle. We're going to hear about the match, the match, the match, the match. Oh yeah, the match, and about what happened in the years after the match. Now bear this in mind, I'm asking these people to trawl back into their memory banks, to cast their minds back to remember things that happened over four and a half decades ago. Events for which there is incredibly little documentary evidence. What we're getting here is their memories, their stories, this is their truth. So the main people we're going to hear from are Tongham team members Dennis Rolfe, Ray Fitchett, Graham Warner, David Broomfield, Bobby Davis, Kenny Lambert, Terry Lambert, Mickey James, Sue Green speaking for John, Hazel Littler speaking for Paul, and June Beardle speaking for Charlie, who was the manager and the linesman on the day. Joe Smith, he was the, used to be the policeman, the village policeman. His idea was to start a youth football team. Joe Smith, the local copper. Oh dear. Joe was a club man. Joe was sort of like a guard, you know what I mean? I used to go watch Guildford City with him on a Monday night. He had a good um, purpose. He determined he wanted, he wanted to get involved in the village and he wanted to get involved in the football team. He used to shout at uh, the team, our team. Not very constructive criticisms, let's put it that way. Most of the game was him shouting at us and I was shouting back at him, but 
He, his heart was in it. So he wanted to see, he, he saw the boys doing something. He asked Charlie to help him. That's how it came about. Charlie and Joe started it off together, really, you know. Charlie Beadle was a, a local star. Charlie was absolutely, yeah, he was an inspiration for the team, you know. They all loved him because he, he wouldn't stand any nonsense. Charlie was very involved. He was very involved with the club, very involved with the team, very passionate. He was chairman for 36 years. Uh, and apparently he used to pay, pay the kiddies along the touchline to cheer for him. Whether that was true or not, you'll have to ask June. I mean, when you first met Charlie, you thought, well, a bit of a strange fella, but he, he, he was a great guy. He was. He was, and, it, and he, he took it serious, but he, he didn't want no messing about. You had to go there and you had to train twice a week. Tuesday, Thursday. And it is an odd way. He's a bit of a philosopher too, wasn't he? Yeah. And it wasn't just about no a bunch of kids off the street uh, kicking. No, the ball. and he wanted he wanted all the boys together. Yeah, he did. I mean, it it we used to go down the pub with him, and we were all underage. They let us drink cider, didn't they? Yeah. Didn't they? So, yeah. Although it was alcoholic, it wasn't so bad. <laughs> and yeah. don't call me mate. You could never call him mate. Oh no. You don't call me mate. Mr. Beard or, or Charles, but not mate. Never mate. <laughs> and even till, probably till the day he died, because I, I, I did meet him a couple of times, probably a couple of years before he died, and uh, somebody come, I heard somebody say, oh, mate, you don't call me mate. He would never let anybody call him mate. My name's Charles. He wanted success, Charlie. He always did want success. And he brought June, his wife, on board. She. Uh, she used to all support us there, she always got the oranges. And he also had a good relationship with like parents that. too, didn't he? Yeah. Well, it might have just been ours, because we were local lads anyway, but I, mean, I think he did, didn't he? Yeah. He? Charlie, I always think of Charlie and June as my second mum and dad, and I'm godfather to one of their children, you know, so that's how close I was with Charlie, you know. He's one of the good guys, and he, and he helped a lot of youngsters. Mm. Kept us off the street. He likes his beer, how oh, Charlie did. Most of the team was uh, from the Yeomans Bridge Secondary Modern team. When we left school, um, we formed a, well, it wasn't us, it was Tongham actually, that formed this youth team. First season Tongham youth side, I couldn't play, I was too young. So Joe Smith had to get permission from the headmaster for me to play. There was, there was a reputation with the team anyway, because we, we, you know, we grew up together, didn't we, playing on the records, yeah. the papers, you yeah. know, jumpers of a goalpost, all that bit. When um, Tongham youth became too old to play, in youth football and started joining, uh, playing in men's football. Um, I wasn't happy with with the Tongham team, and uh, I mentioned to Charlie that now they were playing men's football, I'd I'd come and play for him, and he, he didn't really believe me to begin with, and he said, "Nah, he said oh, you, you won't come." I said, oh, "Well," and he, and he said, "We'll prove it by being a sub for a couple of weeks." So. Uh, I did that and that's how, and I eventually started playing and that's how it came about. Graham Warner lived opposite me and uh, we got involved, I probably got involved with via Graham and we used to go down there, do a bit of training or whatever, to kick about and uh, from there I uh, developed to, to get into the team. We were quite uh, together, we were all together as a, as a group. So it was a very social team but um, we played hard. Um, perhaps too hard at times. And because we had that sort of, you know, that unity then, you know, we went up through the youth stage and then got into the senior league and we were just winning everything, weren't we? Yeah. Because, yeah, we you just... know, guys sort of far more mature than us were getting on the pitch thinking, oh, a bunch of kids. Yeah. The season before we got, uh, we all got booked, we finished up a, um, a winner and a, and a runners-up medal. The season we got booked, we was two runners-up and the following season, because obviously the team was improving as it went on, we got two winners' medals, one in the league and one in the cup. I can remember one cup final we played and we actually got beat. But the, the, after the game, we all got together and you thought we'd won. It was in, in, incredible, incredible togetherness we had. 
They brought us right in at Division yeah. Three, I think, wasn't it? Right at the bottom. Yeah. And we, and we went right through up to the uh, to Division One. And that attitude bought us a goal every game. Mm. You know, because they actually came on with something. Oh, crikey, you know, a bunch of nippers, but we took them apart. Yeah. We wasn't actually a bad side. We wasn't actually a, an aggressive side. We had strikers in in in, in the in the in the back in the, in the in the defence too, didn't we? I mean, we we're all very adaptable players, weren't we? Yeah. Well, yeah. Ray Ray Fitcher. Yeah. I think in the 20 years I played, Ray Fidget was the best player I ever played with because he could play any position and he did. But, but, you know, he even played in goal. He could go in goal, slot in goal, no he problem. He was cracking. Yeah. Cracking goalkeeper. Yeah. We would like him play there, but he, he didn't like playing no. in goal, did he? No, he won the he, glory, didn't he? Yeah, he, 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 he was a good hard <laughs> lad in, in midfield. Yeah, he was. And that was. Like that, right across the pitch. Yeah, yeah. really want it. Yeah. Except for me, I mean, I couldn't play up front. I was too bloody slow. But uh, I'll stop him at the back. What a bulk! <laughs> <laughs> bulk at the back. <laughs> Charlie had a favourite word called gusto, which everything had to be done quick. No train, no game. That's his. Mo that was his motto. You do it with gusto, you know. He sort of got us very fit and got us playing well together. He was a smart trainer, wasn't he? Because he'd actually do a little bit of research like a modern you know, manager would do these days. And he'd, he'd, he'd say, you know, uh, uh, A, took, B or C was pretty tasty. He took it very serious, and Charlie. He'd, he'd yeah. actually make sure that individuals, I had speed, so he put me with someone that was you know, perhaps fast on the, on the front line. And Trained us hard twice a week, down the wreck, in the pavilion, if it was raining. We used to train with a five pound medicine ball and use it yeah. as football. Yeah. We, we yeah. used to be in the small pavilion, and after all the physical fitness stuff, we used to play three aside yeah. with a medicine ball. When we had a, um, a four or three or four or five aside game, if the two Lambert brothers were on opposite sides, they used to kick bits out of each other. And in and training, he, Charlie would never ever put Ken and I on the same side. We always opposed because we fought like cat and dog. Okay. Blood every time we played, wasn't other. there? Hated we did, each other. Apart from on the Saturday, loved each other then. Yeah. But apart from that, we hated each other. We didn't talk for years after. No. Well, as we matured, <laughs> you know. And we, we got really stuck in, didn't we? Oh, I mean, serious, yeah. And it, it certainly hardened you up, especially around the legs. <laughs> Well, I was just a supporter, you know, a loyal supporter, really, because my brother played, obviously, great. The weather wasn't very good. That's the first thing I can recollect. It was a cup match, and it was played at Hawley, not at Tongham, as it says a lot. It was played at Hawley. We played at Hawley. A game at Hawley. Here we have Hawley Village Green. This is where the match took place, just opposite the church, in fact. Until recently, before I saw the newspaper articles and talked to the players, I'd always assumed that the match took place at Tongham, and everybody I spoke to about the match over the years, everybody thought the same thing. You sit in the, you know, the local pub, and it was, oh, do you remember that game up at, up at the wreck when everybody got booked? That's what everybody says, and I've never, ever heard of anything different. I've even met people who claim to have seen the match down at the Tongham Recreation Ground, they're fibbers. So why is this? Well, I suspect it's to do with the Guinness entry. Sport convention is clear. Home team listed first. Whenever you see teams written down, the home team is always listed first. The Guinness article says that Tongham played Hawley and that Tongham won the match 2-0, strongly suggesting that Tongham were the home team. Home team was the first one. Home team first, yeah. And there is a mistake in the entry. A fellow called Ray McCrow, an ex-Tongham youth player who spent most of his working life in the Met, pointed out 3rd of November 1969, the date given for the match in the entry, was a Monday. The match took place on Saturday, the 1st of November. The local press got it right. So how come Guinness got it wrong? Yeah, but you're not going to get that mixed up, are you? And so I got in touch with Guinness again. I wanted to see if they had any comment about the fact that their entry seemed to suggest Tongham was the home team. And also, how come they got the date wrong? Surely they checked and validated everything they put in their book. Were their sources unreliable? Was their sports compiler a nincompoop? If you can't trust the Guinness Book of Records, who can you trust? This is what they wrote back to me.
No. No, none at all. Not to my knowledge. No way. No. We didn't know them, they didn't know us, you know, it was just a game of football. I'm sure they were a league below us, Tell, weren't they? Yeah, but it was that, it was that, it was that ongoing attitude that teams had. About yeah, tongue of use. They didn't like tongue of use. They did didn't they? like us. It wasn't. It wasn't. It had nothing to do with the way we played because we, you know, it was always very civilized, wasn't it? But we were a cracking team. I think it's the old story. A lot of people don't like successful teams, do they? No. You know, you think, well, we'll have them. Yeah. We'll have them. Chris Smith Gander, for some reason, I don't know. He never turned up. Unfortunately, he had to miss the game. He had a wedding to go to. His place was taken by someone that actually just came to watch the game. They brought in another guy. A young fella used to come and watch us and train with us called, um, what was his name? David Broomfield. He used to go and watch him play. He'd go with Graham Moore in his car and just uh, take, he used to take me boots. And uh, I got asked, would I be prepared to play because Christmas Gander never turned up? They just brought him in as Christmas Gander. <laughs> I don't know whether we played an illegal player or... I was about 14, 15. He was younger than me. And then I was, I was under the age, really, to play. You had to be over 18 or such like. Uh, so he played. It was typical of that era you know, it was get stuck in. It didn't seem that bad a match in terms of, I mean, there's always a little bit of dissent, a little bit of niggle going on and, um, you know, players um, arguing about throwing and contentions for that, but nothing majorly bad about it. There's no fighting, no nasty tackles, or no sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, anything that was vicious, in my opinion. Tackles were going in and that, you know, but wasn't dirty. They, they, they came at us because they knew we were good. They knew we were good. We, was, we were odds-on favourites to win. And I think it was something like quarter-finals, next place yeah. in the semi-finals. Yeah. Um, so, so we were going there as favourites. And they basically wanted to stop us playing. We were a good football inside. And I think the referee was a bit young. Maybe because Hawley was, I think, probably a league above us that we felt a little bit intimidated. And as the game progressed, tackles were beginning to come thick and fast. We weren't having any of that. There was there was some hard stuff. I don't think it was a dirty game. I think it was, you know, it was a, a good game of cup football. A lot of people got excited on the line more than actually on exactly, the pitch. Yeah. You know, that's that's where it all and perhaps where it originated from. And of course, the referee was he, he bit was of an experience, wasn't it? He was a bit of an experience. He was taking a lot of stick from people on on the yeah, line. Yeah. Um, and and we just and it and it, it flows onto the pitch as well, don't you? We, we start getting stuck in more. You're getting away with it a bit more, so you give it a little bit more. Especially me and you at the back. Well, they never got past. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we. He was, was big. I was fast. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if, if I couldn't catch him, I always knew you were, didn't Yeah, you? exactly. And then the game went on, and we scored twice. And as we, as we scored twice, the game got more argumentative. Hawley was probably not liking the result at the time. And um, things got a little bit out of hand. It was a little bit noisy, but... You know, there was nothing really to go on. And the referee... He was uh, not very good. But not... I wouldn't say he was biased or anything like that. He was not very good for both sides. And I think both sides were, you know, almost laughing at him at, at, at the end. Yeah, you, well, you know what it's like in local yeah. football. Come on, ref, what are you doing, yeah, you exactly, know? Yeah. What about him over there? Yeah. He's just done this, he's just done that. You haven't booked him. I think the referee was a bit young. He thought he was doing the right thing. But as the game went on, I think the referee, I don't know, lost a bit of control. He just lost control. Just completely lost control of the game. Players were doing as they liked. It was a good hard physical game. And it was a great game to play in. Oh, it yeah. really was. And we only beat them 2-0, yeah. um, which we were expected to beat them more than that. But they, they come at us and they give us some. Arguing. And, and we, we always give it back. Swearing. Knocks and bruises and, you know, Fisty cuffs on the pitch, I thought them was. 
officials, were they booked? Some of the I think linesmen was booked. Even the linesmen got involved. It was always the way with in any match, you one team would provide a linesman for each side. Our linesman, which who was Charlie Beadle. During the game, uh, Charlie Beadle, and he's running the line. He got booked. Everybody was always sticking their flag up too early or too late. Uh, our linesman was sticking his flag up perhaps a bit too quickly and uh, the opposing team didn't like it and then the ref didn't like it and everything escalates from there. Why so did the linesman get booked, do you remember? Mouth. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was too much, too much of that. Oh, OK. Shortly afterwards, a row blew up between the referee and linesman Beardle who is also Tongham's trainer. Mr Beardle told the referee he was going to report him and then found himself booked for what he later learned was dissent. It's not every, every week that a manager gets his name taken. You know? <laughs> the referee said, I took the linesman's name for dissent. At one stage in the match, he threw his flag on the floor and after that, he never seemed to have the same interest in the game. About throwing the flag down, I don't think Charlie would do that. You can imagine Charlie throwing his flag on the floor though, couldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Charlie was, you know, he was mortified. Really. It seemed to me like the referee um, basically wasn't quite in charge of it, and for some reason, I don't know what, he just went a bit pen happy. The game itself was tough as any cup match would be. Um, there was one of our guys taken to hospital, but I don't, I can't recollect it being a bad foul or anything like that because none of, no one was sent off from their side. So I think that rules it out anyway. Next, the referee booked a Hawley player for a tackle which injured a Tonga man who had to be taken to hospital. I didn't even think it was a rough game. Didn't take the notice of what happened. I can't think of the name of the guys that ended up in hospital. Because one of our players he used to work with Ken Lambert. It was Paul Littler uh, and I worked with him and I used to play with him on a Sunday. I know he was a big football fan. Um, he didn't play anymore when I met him because he was 40 then, I think. He'd had enough of football. And uh, he, was, he was a good little player. He, he was quick and uh, he was quite tricky with the ball. So I'd, um, I, th I think Charlie must have got in touch with me and said, look, we're going to be one short cup game. We don't want to, we don't want to lose it, obviously. So um, and I, obviously I think we, we must have been a few players short because we, we weren't in the habit of doing that. One of our players was not badly injured, but injured enough that he couldn't play on and we had to call an ambulance. He had to go to hospital. Poor little bugger got sent to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> his stitches put in his head. Off he went to hospital. Yeah, he told this story a lot about how he was booked when he was in his hospital bed. Yeah, I do, I do, I do remember something getting sent off, yeah. I don't remember anyone being sent off, oddly. Has anybody owned up to being sent off? Mickey James. Mickey James, yeah. It's now you brought Mickey James's name up. I can remember him. Is he the one that got sent off? I think he was a little bit older than us. It would have been. Oh, Mickey, would he? Been. He was a yeah, bit cocky, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. That's probably some Mickey. tart on the on the. Yeah, he wanted to get away. Over it, so. <laughs> no, he's like on a Saturday night. All was out. But he was. He was a good footballer. Very good footballer. But he was a little bit fiery, and I think on this particular time he. He did get sent off, I can remember that. I seem to remember about 10 minutes before the end of the game, he must have got fed up with me telling him how useless I thought he was and, and sent me off. Well, after the match, we was in the change room getting dressed and all that, and then he come walking in and he said, I'm... I need all your names, I'm booking you all. And someone said to him, might have been Charlie, I don't know. Why? And he said, for descent. Someone shouted up, he said, descent, that's when like when Jesus came down from heaven or something. And he said, no, it's for continual arguing and fouling and all this stuff. Sort of and then he took all our names. We found out that he booked all the Hawley players as well. At the end of the game, referee, Mr John McAdam, 
booked all players for dissent and ungentlemanly conduct. And earlier he had sent off Tongham captain Mick James and booked linesman Charlie Beardle. The guy had taken so much verbal from people yeah. and, and I think we were probably still giving it a bit of verbal in the change room. Possibly. Amongst ourselves. And he'd and he just come in and said, right, you're all booked. Yeah. And he'd give a sheet of paper and we'd like to put our names down on a piece of paper. And all 22 players all got booked and everything. I remember getting booked and uh, told that we was all booked in the changing rooms. And everybody was quite surprised. Charlie come in and, and said that the referee's booked us all. When it was over, John came out and he said, that stupid ref, he said, he came in and asked for all our names. They all gave their names and he said, right, I'm booking you all for dissent. Me, I was just taken aback. I couldn't believe that we were, were all being booked. I couldn't believe it, you know. They were all coming out of the dressing room and all ready to go home. And they were all saying, we've all been booked. <laughs> we've all been booked. It was just so funny. They just found it hilarious. We found it amusing, really. It's amazing, isn't it, really, that he must have been um, some kind of weird ref <laughs> to book the whole lot. I just think he must have lost control and got a bit embarrassed and um, decided to act after the match. It was absolutely it was all, it was all gobsmacked. He went, what? What's going on? John Warner, a spectator not connected with either club, Graham's brother, said it had been a clean game. There were very few fouls. I was shocked when I heard what the ref had done afterwards. I couldn't understand why, he said. Because I'd been sent off, I'd, I was obviously in the changing rooms. It seemed like about ten minutes later to me, the, the referee came in and, and said we, he's going to book everybody. And then we told him, well, he wouldn't be able to book everyone because some of them had already left. I knew I, I, was pl I, I played the game because Chris never turned up. David was probably told to use Chris's name if anything. So as it, when he was booked, he was he, he gave the name Chris Smith Gander. You know, he got to David Brumfield, and David Brumfield said Chris Smith Gander. And <laughs> so at the end of the game, when the names were being recorded by the referee, I had to, I had to say his name. Chris got his name taken, and he wasn't even there. When we phoned him up after. We told him the you know good news and bad news. Um, the good news was that obviously we had won two nil, and uh, the bad news was that he got booked and it was going to cost him money. No, I can't remember doing it. I was, I was, I was short. I would have been short, and I was young, and I, I couldn't go in uh, roughly or falsely because for my own benefit, I could have been crippled. You know. They could turn around and give me a smack in the mouth or what, you know? Probably uh, dissent more than anything, I think. Not really, no. <laughs> I only ever got booked three times in the whole 20 years, and that was one of them. As far as I'm concerned, I was unaware that I'd been booked until the Monday morning, the following Monday, where in the Sun newspaper, I think it was the Monday, it may have been Tuesday, but certainly a couple of days after the match, up was this article saying 23 players booked in this cup match. On the Saturday, the game was on the Saturday. I know on the Tuesday it was in the Daily Mirror because I read it, I was having my breakfast in the morning before going to work. I didn't have time to read who it was. I just said to my mum, oh, it was another game. Oh, 22 players booked, you know, and I got to work, all the blokes started laughing. I said, well, what's going on? And they said, have you seen the paper? I said, right, oh, quick look. And it was us, you know, so, and then the All Shot News, there was a write-up in there, which I can't remember, but, and then there was a little piece, about an inch and a half, like, noted in the news of the world. We won 2-0 at the end of the game. The game, the result was, the result stood, but it went to the FA. The mass booking may pose problems for the Aldershot FA. A spokesman said, I have never heard of an incident like this, with all the players in a match being booked. When the referee's reports are received, they will be dealt with by a disciplinary committee who will investigate the whole matter. We didn't think there'd be a hearing or anything like that, you know, because when you got booked in them days, you just got a, I mean, you got a little fine. 
you know, but if you ever got three bookings or something, you had a suspension, but we thought, oh, uh, just walk under a duck, you know, under the bridge, it's gone. And then, until we got told we had to go to this hearing and all that. So they had a disciplinary hearing for that match. Uh, the old All Shot Supporters Club, by Finches and All Shot, where both teams turned up and the referee. I can't remember if all the players went, but certainly there was quite a few players from, from Tottenham and quite a few players from Hawley at this in, inquiry or investigation or whatever it was. I wasn't allowed in because I wasn't a footballer. I didn't go to it because I, 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 was, I was unofficially, I was playing unofficially. They called up Charlie and Joe, because Joe was like the secretary then, Charlie was the manager. They called up Mickey James because he was the captain. Mick James said, There was a lot of moaning and groaning about the ref's decisions, but I wouldn't have called it dissent. And then they called me up. If I remember right, we didn't all go in in front of I the I certainly the did no, I wasn't. No. I think it, I think what happened, a few started going in and they were getting the same story yeah. from everybody. Yeah. Hawley skipper Brian Stevens said, as the game progressed, the rest decisions seemed to get worse. John came out and he went, oh, I don't know what's going to happen with this. He said, they're not sure. They've never ever come across an incident where a referee's booked everybody, even Charlie. <laughs> he was a linesman. The thing was just thrown out, you know, go away and stop uh, being silly. Well, I thought it might be worth coming back to the library to see if there was any follow-up article. And guess what? There it is, 22 booked men cleared, referee reported. There's the article. It was dismissed very quickly, yeah, I think. Yeah, remember. it was. There but they, they'd, they, they'd heard enough. Uh, and then they obviously discussed it amongst themselves yeah. as these committees yeah. do and then the next thing we knew the referees getting taken in there yeah well, the inquiry was the amusing side of it was the referee turned up with a broken right arm and the poor ref turned up with his arm in plaster i remember that the referee turned up on crutches and apparently he'd had a, a, a i can't remember if it was a bike or a cycle, motorcycle or just a push bike accident yeah so you did feel sorry for him yeah then, but well, actually we didn't really did we no no Looking back, most unkindly, there was an outburst of laughter when he turned up on crutches. They asked me about the question you just said, that, what, did Mickey James swear? Because he, he sent him off for swearing. And I told the hearing, he did swear, but not at anybody, at himself, because he went across the ball and he kicked the ground. So he swore at the ground. The referee questioned that, how far away was I? And I said 10, 15 yards, which I can't exactly remember it today how far it was, but that's what I told the hearing, which is partly true. You know, he did go, to, he did hit the ground, kick the ground, but I'm not too sure that's why he was swearing, but there you go. Did you have to pay a fine? I'm not sure, but I think I did. That. I might have had to pay two pounds or something like that. I can't remember. After hearing evidence from Mr. McAdam and ten other witnesses, the inquiry team, headed by FA Chairman Reg Driver and Secretary Eric Perrin, decided to delete all the cautions to the players and the linesmen from the records, and to report the referee to the county FA. We got away with it. We were, oh, yeah. we were, we were, we were exonerated from exon it. Yeah, exactly. You know, we all went up there, got exonerated. Uh, in fact, I think he got sort of like a light suspension for a couple of weeks. Mr. McAdam said he felt he'd had a good game and that he'd kept the game under control. I think that Chris Smith Gander deserves a special award. I mean, he must be the only man in history who had a booking which was expunged for a match he never even took part in.
I've done a fair amount of research around this and it's extremely unusual for a referee's decision to be reversed. Usually when it does happen, it's the referee who reverses his own decision during the game, following an incident, before plays restarted, after he's consulted linesmen and other players. But as for a referee having his decision reversed by a committee of officials at a subsequent inquiry, well, I could only find one example of that. I was just told that word of mouth that we was in the Guinness Book of Records and uh, that we were in there as the most uh, ill-disciplined team or undisciplined teams and I looked at it and uh, I think I still got a copy in the loft. I was surprised when it got into the Guinness Book of Records though it was absolutely crazy. <laughs> People do talk about it um, but they've, they've not used it in a a way that they think that you're a hooligan or or a or a bad person. They use it in a way that, oh yeah, you was in that, you was in the Guinness Book of Records. But I didn't know how it got in there or who pushed it forward. Perhaps the ref did. <laughs> I myself didn't know it was in there until a couple of years later, until someone told me, but. You know, just went on, life went on, you know what I mean? There was no, we didn't have cameramen round and all that, or people are, you know, it was just, got the odd one, says, oh, it's in the Guinness Book of you know, but it wasn't a big thing. No. Not in the slightest. No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, Not until now. Sometimes you when people say, oh, you played for Tongham, some bring it up about this game, some don't even know it about it, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that know it all about it that wasn't even there. They're coming out with stories as if they were there, and really all it is is hearsay. They've heard it off someone else. Apart from the fact we can actually boast about Guinness Book of Records, yeah, which is fun. Yeah, I quite often use that. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you meet new people. You know, and, and you start having a bit of banter and, mm. and you say, well, I'm lay my claim to fame is that I'm in a Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> hey, what's that? It, it does spark, well, what's that for then? Yeah. Then when you tell them, they're not so keen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just um, something he was quite proud of, that he'd actually achieved something in his life, even if it was only for being carted off and then booked. <laughs> you know? People recognised it. People recognised that... Um, I played and, and bring it up in conversation quite often. Biggest giggle in history. <laughs> Sometimes I've, I mention to people just for a laugh, I'm in the Ginsburg Gross and then this and that, you know, so I tell them what, that's all. But for, very, very rarely these days. We actually used that in his funeral. That was one of the first things that the guy opened with about the Guinness Book of Records and how all the players were booked and how Paul was booked in his hospital bed. Well, it impacted when we got called up by London Weekend Television. Oh, it must have been about 19, probably 1981. They started doing Game for a Laugh. Some of the people that had played in the infamous game were invited um, to go up to the, the studios to record what was a pilot show for Game for a Laugh. I got a phone call uh, here from, from a, a TV woman. And I thought it was Candid Camera. They actually got in touch with us all to see whether we could do a pilot show. And it was quite nice because it had been quite a few years since we all been together and we all met up there and we, we got um, taken into like the, the lounge beforehand and we had a few beers in the lounge and, and a chat and, and I think only one of their guys actually turned up from Hawley. I wouldn't see seats then. Told us when to clap and when... Do you remember who was on the... Uh, I just don't know. And they were on about shin kicking in Cornwall. Some lovely, shin yeah, they do a sport. Yeah. They, they kick one another shins, you know, just that, like with smocks and that on, you know. Um, didn't know this if if this was ever going to get shown or not, but as far as I can remember, it was the very first one that was broadcast, and Charlie, Dennis, Rolf, and a few of the other players were just asked to stand up in the audience, and they waved, and they mentioned the, the game uh, and whatever. 
Yeah, I, and my wife, she knows, she can remember more about it, but she said we went to see it at uh, LWT. Was it LWT? We were all sitting in a row, all the, the team, and then one of them read out about um, a team that was all booked. And as they brought this subject up, we were to stand up and cheer. And then we all stood up and cheered and used our rattles and all that, and they panned the camera across us. But, I mean, all we had to do was put on these stupid hats and scarves and stand up and the, the camera panned round. Um, unfortunately, it didn't pan round far enough for me because I took my brother-in-law up there and it actually stopped at him. So my moment of glory was, <laughs> was never to be seen because I was cut off at the end. I've often uh, reminded him of that. And then we all sat down and that was it. <laughs> The disappointing thing was we all got shoved at the back of the flipping studio, right at the back, and we had about a 30 second stint and thought, what's this all about? You know, it, it was something and nothing. I can't remember anybody being interviewed though, I don't know if we were. It was a late night, I seem to remember, it was a late night, Saturday night programme, and they mentioned this game and there was a, a few of the lads that played for Tom who were in the audience. and. And I think it was mentioned then that it was in the Guinness Book of Records, but I wasn't aware until then that it was in the Guinness Book of Records. But it, it was great seeing what lads could make it. It was great being together again. And of course, we all said, oh yeah, we must do this again. But it never Doesn't happened. Happen. It never happened. <laughs> Yeah. For using one minute's worth of, from an ITV program. Okay. And that would give you one country. Okay. Did you hear that? One minute, one minute of an ITN program in your documentary or whatever, that's going to cost you five hundred and twenty-four pound seventy. That's that's sort of ten pound a second, isn't it? We pay that. It's not very cheap, is it? No, it's not. It's disgraceful. Isn't it? Bloody awful. It, don't swear. You didn't hear that. Oh, you got that on. I wanted to see that Game for a Laugh footage. Turns out I could get a personal copy, this, ooh, for a mere £54. What a bargain. Um, so I'm going to watch it and describe to you what happens. Ready? Okay, there's a bit about shin kicking, which is a sport where people kick each other in the shins. Uh, and apparently this shin kicking goes on at the Cotswold Olympic Games, if you're interested. Then there are shots of footballers fouling each other, which takes Matthew into his spiel. And then he introduces Britain's two most undisciplined football teams. Mm, says they're in the Guinness Book of Records. He then goes on to say, quote, all 22 players plus a linesman got sent off. Well, that's wrong, isn't it? We know that's wrong. And then, and I quote, and that was even before the match even started. Well, that's wrong. And is that even possible? Can you send people off before the match has started? Where are you, lads? Says Matthew. Then you've got a long shot of seven people dressed in red and white scarves with matching bobble hats, and they all stand up and they rattle their rattles for all they're worth, and that lasts for about three seconds. Then they all sit down. Then Matthew introduces a single player from Hawley. He stands up and he shakes his rattle really, really hard, and then Matthew says, sit down, you unruly thing. And that's it. Well, I would say hats off to Game for a Laugh for getting so many things wrong in such a small segment. The whole thing lasted 46 seconds. Uh. Being the secretary, I then received a letter a, a while later, uh, maybe a couple of weeks later, from uh, the Football Association when they were based at Lancaster Gate. Ted Croker, who was the secretary at the time, um, informing us that if we ever appeared on a TV uh, programme without their permission, uh, especially as they felt it was bringing the game into disrepute, that the club and all the players would be suspended. So don't ever do it again.
Oh, I think it would be a, a, a big news thing. It would be because I think football today is played a different way. I think this is more South American than than uh, English. I think it would be horrendous. <laughs> you would have had people knocking on the door and trying to photograph you and get the story, and it would have been a lot more involved than it was then. It would probably get blown all out of proportion, I would Yeah, thought. I mean, it would hit totally you too big time, wouldn't it? With these Facebooks and Twitters, it had been, it had been all, all over the place, wouldn't it? Might have been made to TV, you never know. I think it would be quite a news thing. I think they'd think it would been it'd been done for money for sort of publicity to get on YouTube or or something like that if it if it was done today. Yeah. Oh, it, I think it'd be a YouTube hit, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? It'd go absolutely mental. If if it was an amateur club side, I think obviously it'd be in the media more, and there'll be people looking at why it's happened and what's caused it, and uh, they they want to know a lot more than they did then. It wasn't too much in the way of, um, other than the LWT thing, which was more of a, a laugh, really, wasn't it? I don't know what that was all about. Well, it, w it, it would be bizarre, because I don't think it would in, in professional football anyway. Um, I mean, they fall over like a pack of cards net these days anyway, So it's, uh, which is why I prefer rugby now to football. Uh, I think they're overpaid and they overact. Football today is like netball, isn't it? You're not allowed to touch, you're not allowed to tackle. Probably wouldn't happen though, would it? In that, you know, rules and regs now are far sharper and you know, you can't. Yeah. You, you, the physical game's gone. What, what we've done then in those days, we wouldn't get away with now. No, no you wouldn't. It's a different game, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't go watching local football now, so I don't know what it's like out there, but I should imagine it's it's got to be pretty much the same. They follow the same rules yeah. now, don't they? So, um, yeah, it, it would probably never got to that. No, no. No, never. No. no. Um, couldn't even tell you what he looked like. No. I, I can't even um, visualise him now. I wouldn't recognise him if I saw him today. Not since the hearing. Only at the hearing. Unless he's walk, he might have walked by me and in, 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 I'm out shopping or something, but I, I wouldn't have known. Um. Some coarse words, <laughs> you know. That's what I would say, you know. I don't know. How are you doing? <laughs> I'd have to shake his hand and, and apologise for giving him such a hard time. <laughs> well, I suppose I'd thank him because, uh, you know, we've uh, had our moment of glory with the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, we got to see London Weekend Television on the first uh, game for a laugh show. So, yeah, thank you, Ref. I actually asked him what came across. What, what was he thinking of? I wouldn't have anything bad to say about him. He obviously didn't do it to get in the Guinness Book of Records because he didn't know it was going to go in there. But I'd like to talk to him about the, the what went on again. And yeah, I, and I, I, I personally felt sorry for the guy when he walked out. You know, he'd, uh, from the tribunal. Yeah, from yeah. the tribunal. Yeah. Not, I mean, I, we thought not on he, the day. We thought he was a plonker on the yeah, day. Exactly. Absolute plonker, and we yeah. probably told him so. Uh, how we got away with it. I think but, he did. Um, yeah. after the hearing, I did, yeah, I did feel sorry for him, really. Did he have a bad game? Because well, he didn't have a very good game. He was only doing his job, wasn't he? Or what he, or what he thought was his job, to the best of his ability. Yeah. What, what was you thinking of booking everybody in a game of football, 22 players and the linesman? Was he trying to cover up for having a bad game? I don't know. I, I'd just like to know he's thinking of it, you know, what... Why well, he done it? And I said, and I, I, I would have said, um, and I don't know if he did. Did he book the player that was uh, went to the hospital? After the match, the ref actually came to the hospital where he was, uh, whether Paul had really given him a mouthful on his way out when he was stretched out or not. I don't know, but he um, booked him while he was in his bed. Do you know what the animal is on the team logo? Animal on the team logo. No, I don't. 
being a natural historian, I should know this, and I've got no idea. No, I'm sorry. It was, the, it was a deer, wasn't it? That's the white heart. Well, it's a heart, isn't it? Not a stag, is it? Stag? Is it a stag? Really? Yeah. A stag. Your white heart? Okay, great. White from the White Heart pub. As soon as you said it, I thought, yeah, there is something. There is something. And, and I was, and I, and I thought, there's something to do with the White Heart. I didn't know we had a logo in those days. I didn't. No. Which one are you talking about? <laughs> it was a song Charlie made up, which I never did know the words. Uh, Oven and the rude ones he used to make that. No, I can't remember. No idea. They do, they do, and put rude words to it. It comes from an opera, and Charlie made all the words up to it. He'd um, have us all singing it, like and singing rude songs and things like that. Yeah, it went out of the bag. That's not the one you're thinking of, though, is it? No, Ray Fitchett sang me a song. Did he? We are men of soccer, we are tongue and swords. We try very hard to conquer, we lose more than we ought. But we're all good friends together, we're jolly good company. So it's... White Heart Beer. Something like that. For that there, was a, there was another verse, but that was crude. There was something about a pregnant woman, it's like a girl getting pregnant or something, wasn't it? At the end of the football season, we put our boots away. We chase all the likely fillies. There's some in the family way. With booze and contraceptives, we idle our time each day. Merrily, oh, I can't remember the last two lines, sorry. The words of I remember, the words was, Last night I lay in bed and tickled me plunker. It was good, and the old and all that, and it goes on all that a bit rudeness and all that. So, you know, <laughs> it was a lot of young fellas. Instead of being in the village up to no good, they was put together and, and played football, and uh, it it, uh, it made it made for a, a better life for everybody. When I went called up to the hearing, and they asked me that question, and I said. I just thought it was a good, clean, hard game. And that was put in the book, but they didn't put my name to it. Because I'm, I'm not very happy about that, really, because that'd be my bit of fame, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? Good, hard game. <laughs> I like that. Good, hard game. I would just say, OK, it was a, a one-off game. We made history. We can't, we can't turn time back and, and replay it, I'm afraid. I was surprised because it wasn't that it wasn't that uh, dirty game. I mean, if there'd have been fighting and and you know and, and a real dirty game, then you could have understood it. But it wasn't that way at all. You know, it was just just an ordinary game, really. I'd like to think that there's a possibility of a reunion that comes out of this. You know, that, that would be nice. Most of the folks came along, and it was a real pleasure to be around them and to see them reconnecting and enjoying each other's company after all these years, almost as though no time had gone by at all and the air was filled with stories and laughter and anecdotes and reminiscences from those far-off footballing days of the Tongham youth team. I'd managed to get hold of some old Tongham team shirts and I got the lads to put them on and pose for the camera. As the real referee wasn't likely to suddenly magically appear, I persuaded my friend Stuart, the bogus referee, to come along and give the folks a little surprise. Well, well, well. Yes, yes, yes. Heavy defender, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, remember, remember, no talking back, no back chat from you guys. Yeah. Well, they're all going to get a yellow card straight away. 
I know his daughter Emma. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And as I watched the fun and games, I couldn't help but wonder, what would the real referee have made of tonight? Yeah, can I take my um, sling off now?